Amen. I want to start out, I want, I want us to all recite, read um, Psalm 23. You can put that up there. It's a, it's a psalm we all know. And if not, I can just recite it and you probably all can read. Uh, okay. Oh, did you? Okay, not a problem. So I'll, I'll read it and you guys just follow along with me. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen, amen. Um, I always like to title my messages, um, and I've titled this one, To Have Goodness and Mercy, You Must Come to the Table. To have goodness and mercy, you must come to the table. This, this message is um, indescribably personal to me. It has been in the works for uh, a few months now. And, 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 I, and I'll speak to Betsy this morning. <laughs> Betsy, thank you for being honest. Because it's, there's value in being honest when we struggle. There's value in it that, that we all can relate to. You, you all agree? Is that we, we all go through things. We all struggle with things. And like I said, this, what I'm going to share is indescribably personal to me. But I am willing to be vulnerable. And I am willing to be transparent into helping you understand that when you go through hard times, there's hope. And there's, there's something in it that God wants us to see. And it's the only reason I'm standing here today is because God has made sense of the chaos in my life. And it's the only reason you're here is he's made some peace, some reason, uh, purpose for what all that we go through. Um, so a while ago, uh, an individual said some very, very, very hurtful words to me. And... Um, as normal we do, we try to talk it out with the person. And this individual did not want to have anything to do with talking it out with me. So, and I'm sure we all have been in that place where we want some form of reconciliation, some form of let's talk about this, and there's no room for it. Maybe it's on your side. Maybe you won't, don't want it. Um, and maybe it's from the other person. So that was where I was left. And I'm the type of person who, when something, somebody has something against me, it eats at me. It eats at me. I'm just that type of person that I try to reconcile. And, and if I did something to offend you, and I knew, I, I always try to, you know, make a resolution to that because it just eats at me. So, so here's the, 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 the dilemma. <laughs> I'm left trying to figure out, what do I do with this? This person said some very hurtful things about me, towards me. And I can't fix it. So, it begins to fester. And it actually turns into hatred for this individual. And then I recognize it. I'm going, oh my goodness, where am I headed? Because this is starting to affect me in a huge negative way. I'm going to speak to this because I want to be transparent. Okay? You know, and I know, I know you're all going to agree with me. <laughs> you, can, you can come into this church, I can come into this church, and put a smile on my face, like everything's okay, when everything is not okay. Y'all been there? And, and that's what I did. Uh, Sunday after Sunday, 
I put a smile on my face. I said the right things. But inside, I was just a wreck. Because I was battling with this hatred. So, I finally said, God, how do I get over this? How do I overcome this? Because it's just, it's just ruining me inside. And, and I, I've, I did what I was taught to do, and that is to pray. But, but I went a little further, and I started to pray for this individual. And I began to pray earnestly. It, was, it wasn't easy in the beginning. But I began to earnestly pray good things for this individual. God would bless them. God would bless them in their job, in their family. And, and I began to go through that. And, and, and all of a sudden, I began to pray this one thing over and over again. And it was, Lord, I pray that goodness and mercy would follow them. And I began to pray it over and over. And, and I don't know, I, to me, it was the Holy Spirit that said, Matt, look into that. Look into that. So again, I'll be honest, I didn't know where it was. <laughs> I've heard it quoted a hundred times, but it's like, where is that scripture? And of course, it brought me to Psalm 23. And so as I began to study it, and as I began to really concentrate on it, I went down to two verses. And it's Psalm 23, 5 and 6. And it says, you prepare a table before me, before me. So Psalm 23, 5 and 6 says, you prepare a table before me. So again, positional, before me. Catch that. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as I began to read that, and, and the Lord spoke to me that it's positional, there is, there is something that has to happen in order for us to see goodness and mercy, okay? And, and, and it was an amazing revelation to me. Not only for me, but my prayer for this individual changed. And it's, it's how God is. It's God, God ministers to one area of your life and he opens up another one and he brings light into something else that you can practice yourself. And that's what happened to me. So I began to pray for this individual that God, um, you, you would bring them to that table. And that table has everything they need for their life. And it's changed my whole life in that my thinking of, you've got to go to the table first. And then goodness and mercy. Will follow you. So God really spoke to me uh, and, and began to really bring healing into my own life on many different avenues. And it's just like the Holy Spirit who gives you uh, uppercut and he goes in for the knockout. <laughs> so he, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me about another area of my life um, that and it had to do with my speech. And, and I know we all have been here where you, you've had one bad thing after another happen to you. You've been there? One bad thing after another. One bad... It's like, God, is there any good news coming? But it just seems like always negativity, always a bad report, always struggling, always something's breaking down. Um, and again, always. And that's how we do it. It's like, always and everything is bad, but it really isn't. And we say this to God, God, when is anything good ever going to happen to me? And that's something I said quite often in my lamenting to God. God, when is something good going to happen to me? God spoke. He brought me right to that, that speech that I spoke so many times. And he said, Matt, it was so clear. He said, Matt, if you want something good to happen in your life, it will happen but you got to come to the table. You got to come to that table. You've got to put your, your mind and your, your, your eyes off of what you are desiring and you've got to put them on the table where I'm going to supply you the, the, the peace and the patience and the food that you are to ingest to give you, to just get you in a place where you're content 
and then the goodness and mercy will follow you. So again, it was, it was, it was hard, but also it was beautiful. What God took me through, through this journey, and, and, I, and I truly cherish those moments that God does these things in my life. Because I want him to speak. I hope you are in the place in your own personal relationship where you ask, God, speak to me. Even, even if it's hard, speak to me. And he will. He will. He absolutely will. So in preparing this message... I, I was really searching the scriptures and, and I was like, God, what, where do you want me to go in the scriptures to really show this picture of coming to the table? And one of my favorite old time, old time or Old Testament uh, stories is the, the story of Joseph, and, which I love, absolutely love the story of Joseph and how his brothers sold him and he got falsely accused and he's in prison and becomes second in command and beautiful picture. It's very well, I could have used that, but it just, God didn't want me to go there for, for I know, a, a, a specific reason. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes to me. And I'm like, Jesus? Is he an example of him going to a table? And I began to search the scriptures and sure enough, I found it. And I just want to give a, 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 just a summary of some things Jesus went through. People in, of his own town rejected him. The religious leaders rejected him. Judas Iscariot betrayed him. Pontius Pilate, who thought he was an innocent man, still went with what the people wanted, crucify him. The Jews rejected him. All his disciples ran. And then he was on the cross. Jesus had every right to be offended. Jesus had every right, I say every right, but he, he had in our eyes, he's the perfect example of, of just being, just destroying all of mankind because of how we treated him. But he didn't. What did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them. He asked his father to forgive all of them, including you and I. Think about that. Think about that. Do we have a right to be offended? We really don't. How much has Jesus forgiven you of what you've done against him? We don't really have a right to be offended. Jesus is our prime example of, of that. So my question is this. How was Jesus able to do this? How was he able to, when Peter said, I'll do anything for you, and Jesus says, no, you won't but still love Peter. How, is he not, how, how did he allow Judas to come up and kiss him on the cheek and not want to just punch him in the face? How, how did Jesus do that? There's a key, not a key, but there's, there's a reason that Jesus, and I, this is really what I want you to see in the life of Jesus, that we are to emulate Jesus. And this is so powerful, and I hope you get this. I'm gonna, these are the scriptures I'm going to hammer one right after another. Matthew, uh, Matthew 14 to Matthew 26, okay? So Matthew 14, 23. So just listen to these. Catch it. And when he, he had sent the multitudes away, so Jesus had just ministered to multitudes, and he wants, probably his flesh wants to go home and take a nap. But what's he do? He went up on a high mountain, on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when the evening came, he was alone. Mark 6, 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Luke 6, 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went up on a, on, uh, uh, out to the mountain to pray, 
and continued all night in prayer to God. Mark 135. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he got up really early. He went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Luke 5.16, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Often. Jesus did this often. Luke 9.18, and it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, what do crowds say that I am? And then Matthew 26, 36 begins the real hard part. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. 26, 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and he prayed saying, Oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not I will but as you will. Matthew 26, 42. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink, your will be done. And Matthew 26, 44. So he left them, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying the same words. I took the time to, to, to read all of those so we can see Jesus prayed a lot. Okay, and I'm going to say it this way. Jesus went to the table with his father a lot. Okay? Jesus saw it necessary to go to this table where his father was supplying him with everything he needed. With everything that came against him his entire life. But it wasn't just a once, one-time thing. It was a continual thing where Jesus went to the table, went out in the woods, went in the mountaintop, wherever he went, and God the Father fed him. God the Father spoke to him. God the Father revealed to him what he needed to know. Are you seeing this? And again, uh, if Jesus saw the value of going to the table, how much more should we see the value of going to that table. What does this table look like? I'm going to describe you the table that I envision, okay, for me. This is my table. My table is a table that is battered. It has broken corners. It has repaired legs. It is stained with tears, but it's also stained with blood. Jesus' blood. It's been broken multiple times because I've smashed it. I've smashed it. I've come to the table and I've shattered it because I didn't like what I heard. Or I was frustrated with what God said. And this is the beautiful thing. The master carpenter has put it back together for me every time. Every time. It's broken, but it's beautiful. It's broken, but it's beautiful. And that's my table. The Holy Spirit gave me this during worship. And I was sitting at that table. And I could see myself speaking to Jesus. And I said, but Jesus, you don't understand what I'm going through. And he responds to me, yes, I do. Yes, I do. It's that time that you come to that table and you have a Savior that can understand what you're going through. He understands what the pain you're going through. He understands sometimes how you feel so lost. So many times in my life, including what I just began this whole message with, is I have chosen to go to the table and say, God, help me. This is who I am. This is where I am. I'm broken inside. 
and he has never, ever denied me. But he has spoken truth. I catch this. He has spoken truth across that table that has given me the ability to expose the lie that I was believing. The, the lie that says, I will never see any good. The lie that says, God cannot forgive me. The lie that says, you've done too many things wrong. The lie that says, Matt, you're not somebody who has a high education, so why would God ever use you? The, the, the lie that says, um, just lie after lie after lie. And, he, and the truth exposes those lies that we are believing. And you won't get to that place of the exposure unless you come to the table. I want you to see the importance of what I, I believe God has revealed to me. In a very, very hurtful time in my life, God brought this to me as a revelation for me to get freedom from what I was going through of being hate, hate just hating this person. Wishing evil upon them. It's like, well, how did I get to this point in my life? And God has slowly freed me from believing a lie to believing the truth. And that truth can only be found at that table. I just listed a few of them here. Daniel. How did Daniel overcome the lion's den? He was a prayer warrior. He went to that table. How did Moses be able to stand in front of Pharaoh and all of Israel? He went to the table. Joseph, I talked about him earlier. How did Joseph overcome all the adversity he went through? He went to the table. He never gave up hope on what God had poured into his life as a kid. He never gave up hope on that. And he always came back to that table as much as I'm sure he probably struggled, but he never gave up hope to believe that God is able. Don't know how, but God is able to fulfill the dream, the dream that Joseph had. So what's, what is on this table? And I believe what's on this table is different from my table to your table. Your table looks different than mine. And what's on the table is different because we're all at different places in our lives. But I found a scripture that I thought was, was really um, revealing to what is on the table and what we need. It's 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. And it says this, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So everything that pertains to life and godliness as it pertains to you, God will have there at that table. And, 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 and the amazing part of it is, He prepares it. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is come. He prepares the table for what you need individually. For you. It's a table of two for you in Jesus. I, 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 I struggled whether to share this or not, and at the very end, I felt like the Lord wanted me to share this. Um, it's Mark 14, 13 through 15. I read this probably two or three weeks ago. Again, one of those verses that just sticks out. And he sent out two of his disciples, and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? 
Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there ready, uh, make ready for us. This is the question. How did Jesus know that? You ever thought about that? How did Jesus know that? Well, you can say, well, he's God, which is probably the answer that came to your mind. But listen to these next two verses. It was an eye-opener to me. John 5, 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. Whatever he, he does, the Son also does in like manner. And then John twelve forty nine, For I have not spoken of my own, own, own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. So can I say that Jesus got a revelation by Father God when he came to the table? When he went out in the wilderness, when he sought the Father, God gave him a revelation of that very thing he said will happen. Am I fair to say that? Do you agree? I, I, to me, that was so eye-opening to me that he, he only does what the Father tells him or shows him. So the Father revealed that to him. So, again, if Jesus needed to go to that table and seek the Father and to digest, to ingest truth. And how, how does, how many people here would raise your hand, how many people have spoken to your life something prophetically? It dropped, dropped your draw, jaw how accurate it was. I, I mean, me. I, I, how do you think they knew that? They, they, they were revealed to them by the Holy Spirit because they're continually, I'm gonna, I'll put it this way, they're continually at that table at, at times in their life. They're continually dining with Jesus and the Holy Spirit who gives that revelation. And that's how it happens, is when you are at that table, the Holy Spirit, Father God, Jesus will speak into your life something that you in yourself would have never known, could have never ever known about a person. Did goodness and mercy follow Jesus? Anybody? Yes, it did. All right, let me say that again. Did goodness and mercy follow Jesus? All right, one more time. Did goodness and mercy follow Jesus? Yes. 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 Just take a look at the life of Jesus. How much good did he do? How much did he bless people? How, the people he healed, the people he spoke into, the children that he laid his hands on, how he impacted them for generations upon generations upon generations. The mercy that he has shown through the cross. It's the ultimate uh, example of mercy <laughs> is Jesus dying on the cross for you and I. So again, Jesus was the, is the example going to a table, choosing to go to a table in order for goodness and mercy to follow him, to follow him all the days of his life. How do you get past an offense and forgive? You go to the table. How do you get past your past? You go to the table. How do you believe the truth and expose the lie you are believing? You go to the table. How do you believe you have a future and a hope? You go to the table. And whatever else you're going through, the answer is Jesus. The answer is, you go to the table. You go to the table. And I just want to say this, that, that table, again, is different for every one of us. Um, it, night, it, it could be in worship. It could be in prayer. It, it's just spending time with your Father. 
It's, it's soaking Him in into whatever, wherever you are at that time. And like I said, it can happen in worship. It can happen in prayer. Uh, it can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to be you sitting in church. It can happen in your car. It can happen at work. You can choose to go to that table wherever you are. But ultimately, it is your choice. It is your choice. Because I had, like I said, my, my table is full of repairs because I have smashed it. I have smashed it. Because I didn't want, I didn't want it. I wanted to do it my way. And I rejected Jesus. And I rejected His way. And I rejected the healing that He so wanted me to stay at the table for and say, Matt, take my, take my hand. And I said, no. I want to do it my way. And it always ends up bad. Always ends up bad when you do it your own way. I want to conclude with this. It's Psalm 78, 19. And this is the lie of Satan. The children of Israel said this. Even after everything God had done for them, after everything, the miracles He had shown them over and over and over and over, and I could just go on all day. We're the same way. But we come to a place in our lives and we say, God, how are you going to bring a table in this situation? Right? This is beyond you. You can't touch this. This is too big for even you, God. And that's where the children of Israel were. They said, yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in this wilderness? And we say the same thing. When we're faced with a bad report, when we're faced with bad news or a bill we can't afford or uh, somebody who won't talk to you because you want reconciliation and you say, God, even you can't deal with this one. But he says, yes, I can. Yes, I can. That's a lie from Satan. I've been there and I know a lot of you have too. But I want to expose it this morning. And I want you to see for your own, your, your own, your own situation you're in, God is able to prepare a table in your wilderness. He is able to prepare a table in the midst of your enemies. That's the most beautiful thing about this, is that he can place that table. He is sovereign. And he places the table in the midst of your wilderness, of your disaster, of your frustration, of your wondering, God, what are you doing with me? And he says, come and sit. Sit with me. Take my yoke. It's light. It's not heavy. It's light. And it's your choice. It is ultimately your choice. So, I, I just want everyone just to close your eyes. And, and I want you to think in your own life right now. Wh what does your wilderness look like? What are you facing today that you just feel like, I don't know, I don't see an end. I don't see any hope. I'm struggling, dear God. I'm getting weak. I want you to just have a conversation with him right now, if you can. Tell him. Tell him where you are. Tell him about your situation. You just take a couple minutes and do that in your, own, in your own head. Father God, you have heard the prayers of your people. And Lord, as, as they have spoken to you, Lord, that is their table. That is the time they have reached out to you. And Lord, you have promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So Lord, I know that you are there to meet each and every one here. And I ask, oh God, that you will minister to them where they are. That in them taking the steps of coming to that table, Father. I pray 
however you do it, Lord, that you will show them that you are there at that table. And that you are slowly, methodically answering their prayer, healing their heart. You're arranging things, you're moving things for good. For their favor, for their healing, for their restoration. And I thank you, dear God, that we all have testimonies of time and time again, you speaking when we ask. You meeting us at that table. And I pray, Father, that this morning that we will have a renewed sense of coming to that table. Because you will always meet us. I just want to end with this. Um, I, I, again, a lot of times, I, 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 again, being transparent, there's many times I've stood up here and I haven't read my Bible for weeks. And, you know, I've, I've gone through those things. But I can, I can say today, by the grace of God, I yearn to be with God. I hardly watch TV anymore. I come home. This is a miracle. I come home. I look forward to going to my desk and praying and reading my Bible. I haven't always been there. But that is my prayer for each and every one of you, that you have that hunger for him. It's so beautiful when you truly come as you are and say, God, this is, this is who I am. All my failures, all my faults, all my insecurities, all my doubts. And he, and he just takes your hands and says, oh, I'm okay with it. I'm just glad you're here. And he slowly starts speaking truth into your life that will set you free. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. I'm forgiven. Praise God in heaven who